I should add one more thing that we're, as always, very fortunate to have this event recorded and posted to the Data Science Sydney YouTube channel. So who here is a member of the Data Science Sydney YouTube channel? Wow, there's actually some hands. I suggest you join it. Every single talk we do with possible exceptions when people don't want to be recorded, it does happen, but I'd say 99% of our presentations are recorded. And this is all thanks almost entirely, there have been a few exceptions, but it's, it's been thanks almost entirely to the efforts of one man, Greg Pearl, mm -hmm. currently representing the Onset Group. Greg is unfortunately not here today, he's not well, but he usually will make the very first announcement which we conduct after the presentations have concluded, and Greg is a recruiter. So those of you looking to start a career or improve your career in data science, Greg is a terrific person to talk to and you'll see him in person next month, I'm, I'm quite sure. But now let's move on to our next presentation and we're very fortunate to once again host Dr. Michael Bewley who, as I said before, we are deeply grateful for, for arranging this terrific venue for us in the first place. Thank you again, Mike. So Mike has a, an amazing career in, um, in analytics, um, data science, image recognition. Um, so he started out by detecting Alzheimer's with brain scans, moved on to complex systems and product analytics at, at, for medical devices at Cochlear. Then he did a PhD in interpreting imagery produced by underwater marine robots and then became a lead data scientist at ComBank. But now he's director of AI at Nearmap a fast-growing Australian technology company that captures high-resolution aerial imagery in four countries. Please join me in welcoming Mike. Thanks, Eugene. I'm now wired up with more microphones than I've ever had on me, and good to go. <laughs> so let's, let's start off with a bit of history. So a, about a little bit over two years ago, I presented here at Data Science Sydney. Um, and I just started my role at Nearmap. I was about two months in, and I presented Deep Pool V1.0 with a deep learning introduction. Um, the brief was to see what was possible with their, their vast treasure trove of aerial imagery, um, and I started with a swimming pool detector. So I spent a couple of days labeling images, um, you know, whacked on an Inception V3 model, um, and did some image classification, and came up with a surprisingly good swimming pool detector. For those who weren't there, we had some true positives, which are, surprise, surprise, swimming pools. We've got some false negatives, which are fairly forgivable. I mean, you've got swimming pools that are covered in trees. Um, you've got ones that are a bit hard to spot. You've got a community pool there, which obviously wasn't represented in my training set. Uh, so they're forgivable. I really actually enjoyed the false positives for this one. There's, um, you had your boat with your blue tarp. You've got your aqua-colored color bond roof just sitting out the back of your house. And then you've got the brightest blue car I've ever seen, and I've never seen one of those in real life, but there it is. So the, the swimming pool detector, based on less than a thousand properties worth of data, um, kind of worked surprisingly well. Uh, this talk is really about what it looks like to take things to the next level. So at that point, I was a couple of months into the role and was hiring for my first two team members. Now, um, with a team of nearly 20 machine learning engineers and data scientists, um, and an AI beta that's out in the open, things look just a little bit different. Let's do a before and after. So we add two years. We're going two to three orders of magnitude more training data. We're switching from image classification, which is just, is there a swimming pool in this image, to semantic segmentation, which is, what is the, what is the class of every single pixel? And then doing some post-processing to kind of um, identify more details about the swimming pool and, and its relation to its um, geospatial surroundings. We take then the best of breed semantic segmentation models and customize them for, uh, I guess, getting the most out of our particular data set. And what do you get? Well, we get some false negatives. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going swimming in that top pool and we had to look at image captures before and after that date to really convince ourselves that it was at one point a viable swimming pool. Um, the bottom one, 
Again, that's not a car. You go backwards and forwards and you find that's just um, a pool with a black tarp over it in winter with some heavy water pooling in the shadow of a garage and we didn't quite get that. What about the true positives? We of course get the same nice bright blue swimming pools, but we get some trickier examples too. So that one in the middle, um, as a human, I had to look at several different images of that spot to see and convince myself that yes, there is in fact a swimming pool hiding under that foliage. Um, and the one on the right, um, it's, yeah, it is actually a swimming pool, or it was at one point in time until it became a, a green scungy circle of, of something. Um, there were, whoop, there were false positives, of course, but I didn't find a nice pick in time for um, this presentation, but they're there. So, okay, you add two years and a, and a massive team and do a bunch of stuff, and the swimming pool model gets better. It gets a lot better. Um, but improving a swimming pool model is just a tiny, tiny portion of what we've been focusing on and what it means to deploy uh, true machine learning solutions at scale. Let's have a look. First, this is a, a shot from a, a freely available mapping platform. Um, and that's the image that goes with it. If you take a look at that middle house, you'll see it looks quite different from the building outlined in the map. Um, they're a little bit out of sync. Um, so let's flip across to a near map image. Much more crisp um, and much more up to date. But um, you guys know um, what semantic segmentation is. And we had a nice intro to some, some deep learning ideas from, um, from Abner. Um, so let's do some semantic segmentation. Now this is straight up output. It's not a particularly cherry picked image and there's no photoshopping of results. That's just the pixel intensity is represented by the, the probability of the pixel being that class. You got orange for roofs, green for trees, yellow for solar panels, blue for swimming pools. Now to get a better look at what's going on, we can just draw some contours around it. We can wash that semantic segmentation result away and you can look and if this fancy clicker thing works, maybe. There you go. Um, you can see a swimming pool there, which you may not have spotted with your eyes had you been looking. Um, you can see it once it's, it's highlighted for you. I particularly like what's going on under the roofs. Uh, so the model was just trained and predicting on these images. Uh, now your brain and my brain will make a guess as to where the roofs end under trees. You'll kind of say a roof is this shape, it kind of will jut out a bit there, it's probably got a square end. Now the model doesn't get it perfect, but it actually really blew us away how well it got, uh, how well it got the result. In, in deep shadow, sure, it doesn't quite push it out, but with a bit of tree cover, no problems. Again, this is straight up output, no, no doctoring of the results. What you can then do is take property boundary data sets, because of course this is geospatially referenced imagery. And you take those property boundary data sets, and, which you can get for free or a fee in any part of the world, um, and you can associate these shapes that you've discovered with those property boundaries. You can make an Excel spreadsheet of one, two, three, fake street, swimming pool, yes or no. So we take a data set of pixels, we apply machine learning to turn that into a geospatial data set, which requires a different set of expertise to manage, and we turn that into an Excel spreadsheet, which I think would be an incredibly powerful data set in the hands of anyone in this room. But that's not enough. Uh, it's not enough to build just a static one-shot data set based on one image. The world is a changing place. Now we capture imagery up to six times a year in major cities. Let's have a look at what happens in less than a year. House gets demolished, foundations go in, walls go up, roof structure starts to go in, roof completed, extra work going on in the backyard, some kind of granny flat or extra shed. Now, if you do what a lot of people doing, um, there's people doing machine learning out there who basically apply a machine learning model and then will get people to fix the results so they look good. And, th and that makes you really limited because it means that you get out of sync with your, your model of the world and the reality. But if you do what we do at Nearmap, which is to, uh, I guess, go for fully autom automated content at massive scale, all you have to do is push the fresh images through and you get your fresh result. You can see there's been a new solar array put in and you can even put back in the trees and a splash of the pink, uh, I guess, construction paint showing there's still ongoing work. Now, uh, in this room, I guess we've, we're pretty focused on machine learning. 
but there's more to life than machine learning. I had to break it too, but there is. Because um, if you want to get results out of this, uh, customers are really interested in, in how things change over time. So you actually need to do a whole bunch of post-processing. So sure, you do semantic segmentation, but all that makes is some pretty pictures. So you need to start finding objects, and then you need to do things like comparing these objects over time and saying, well, is there change? Is that, has that property been altered? Not only has it gone from no solar panels to a solar panel array, can we detect that there's been additional solar panels added? And we absolutely can, all built on the foundation of machine learning by adding algorithms to the top of the stack. So, it makes for a pretty cool demo at this scale, but let's zoom out. So, this is a big chunk of, P of Perth. It's about 300 square kilometers. Now, with near map imagery, um, it's the, the full resolution is about what I showed you in the previous slide. So, if you zoom into any part of this image, you can see that kind of crisp view of any house. So, do the maths, and it works out to be about a 10 gigapixel image if you kept all the pixels. What happens if we do semantic segmentation on 10 gigapixels? Now, to be clear for the machine learning people in the room, this is not taking a downsampled image and then putting it through a semantic segmentation model. This is doing semantic segmentation at absolutely full resolution across that entire area, and then um, and they're just zooming out for the purposes of the presentation. And of course, after that, you can do rolling up of objects, you can do rolling up to parcels, and calculate change over time. That's another layer from the same model. That's the trees in Perth. Quite nice if you're looking at um, impervious surfaces, heat islands, um, green space in council areas, all that kind of stuff. Um, this actually represents a tiny portion of what we've run. So I started talking about AI systems being about more than models. Um, we ran this model uh, earlier this year on about a million square kilometers of imagery at full resolution. That's about 80 million properties um, and about 3,000 times the data you see represented here. And we set ourselves a challenge to see how quickly we could do it, which I'll explain why later. Um, but we did that in about three weeks. Now let's go from trees to a different type of plant. Let's go to lawns and see if the view of the city changes. You spot the golf courses? So to give you a sense of the scale of the operation, um, we were working with AWS, which is the world's largest cloud computing provider. Um, and running on, if you're familiar with GPUs, we were running on K80s. And as far as we can tell, we took pretty much every spot instance of a K80 in the US for three weeks. Um, running across about 18 data centers. Um, it takes a fair bit of compute to run deep learning at scale. Not bad for a little Aussie tech company. All right, let's look at something else. Let's look at construction. You see the little kind of dots which are very small bits of construction going on in backyards and things, all the way through to the really big infrastructure projects, all done with the same model. Um, and what this reminds us is that the world is a changing place and you've got to keep going. So remember that challenge of can we see how quickly we can push out results? If we just wanted to build a one-off static data set, we could do that and we could take our time. But if you want to be able to release new products and things in an ongoing fashion, you need to be able to smash out new models really, really quickly across your full footprint in case customers want it. Um, what's more, people who know about models will know that you can, you can add new categories to models. So, Early on, I showed you four or five different classes. We're currently running models that have uh, between 30 and 40 categories, and they're growing. This one is probably the hardest one to see, but it's my favorite. It's solar panels. Kind of looks like a constellation of stars. You see the, the faint pinpricks of light are the residential solar arrays in Perth, and the big, big bursts of color are the commercial ones. Now, if you... If you look at Perth across our 10 year history, where we're capturing about six surveys a year, you can calculate the uptake of solar in Perth using nothing but imagery. Um, and you can watch it go from 1% uptake to 20% uptake over the last 10 years. That is without doubt the most expensive bar graph I've ever built. So to do things like this, you need to go beyond the mindset of just building a model. So it's a very different approach to the consulting approach and, and the competition approach. Um, what you're trying to do is you're trying to build an engine that can create models. 
and an engine that can create data sets because you've got to be able to do this again and again repeatedly and reliably and extend it and expand it. What we need to be able to do, for those of you who are working in, in areas with sales, you need to be able to cope with the sales team coming in and saying, hey, we've got this wonderful new idea, can you add this in? And you need to plan up front to be able to gracefully and efficiently add in those new things. I'll show one last slide in this series. Um, this is a combination of all of those layers. So this is, a, I guess, a semantic view of Perth, um, which I love looking at. I, I spend hours at work just doing QA on the data and, ex and exploring. It's good fun. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about accuracy. Now, you're a technical audience, so I'll use a different excuse for not talking about numbers with you. Uh, you guys know that you can pick any number you like. I could give you about 500 different performance measures, and I could tweak and tune my test set to get what, whatever number you want. Um, I think the best, um, the best way of describing how well the models are working uh, is actually a process that we have in place. So uh, when we have labelled imagery, labelled by a human, and we get the um, machine learning system to label the imagery as well, they agree most of the time because they're both really good at their jobs. But a small portion of the time they disagree. So what do you do? Well, you send the image back to the humans for relabeling and you say, could you check that? And more than half the time, the human was wrong. So the implications of that are that, forgetting what the absolute accuracy benchmarks of this are, the models are actually more accurate than humans who are trained repeatedly doing this task, experts at it, they're more accurate and more reliable and obviously can operate at far greater scale. Now, I wasn't sure exactly how much um, Abner was going to go into deep, the details of deep learning, so I threw this slide in. How does all this become possible? How, how is it possible to build a system like this? Well, in 2012, this thing happened. Um, a lot of people call it the deep learning revolution. Um, I kind of agree with Abner on the importance of data sets. I call it the ImageNet revolution because I think that's what really sparked it. Um, this new data set got created, 1.2 million images with things from Savoy Cabbage to Water Buffalo, and it was a competition to see who could build the best model. And you see the white dots, suddenly we come in halving the error rate overnight with deep learning. It's just an absolutely phenomenal result. To summarise what goes on, in 2011 we're doing really well to recognise a cat in an image fairly reliably. By 2016 they have to end the competition because we have better than human performance on which breed of cat is in the image. So how do you then measure who has the best model when your gold standard is about the same level of performance as your models? This obviously shook up in uh, the world of research quite a lot uh, and things spilled over into industry. Many of you will be familiar with these sorts of packages, the big guys out there basically making deep learning to accessible to everyone in this room um, and to every room like this around the world. It used to be just a few dozen experts and now any data scientist on the planet can do some deep learning. The chip industry, many of you will know about GPUs and their importance in deep learning. You probably don't know the stat that it's a $3 billion a year industry today just for deep learning GPUs and it's projected to be a $30 billion a year industry in 10 years time. And obviously they're expensive so it's kind of nice to be able to rent them out on the cloud for a couple of bucks an hour. Um, and at this point, you've got to be thinking anyone, and I think probably anyone in this room could go home tonight, you could build your own swimming pool detector, and a decent number of you by morning, if you pulled an all-nighter, would have a half decent swimming pool detector model. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. The issue though, is that the companies that are turning these into real production scale systems, um, products that work at scale and actually get out there, are rare as hen's teeth. Why is that? I think there's three, three fundamental areas um, that can spell the difference between success at scale and not. One is you need a special data set. You guys well know that uh, this game is about the quality of your data. It's not just about the scale of your data, it's about the nuance of it and the quality of it and um, really the uniqueness of it. Um, so I'm, I'm quite fortunate to be at Neomap where we've got this um, aerial imagery data set that has a million square kilometres of coverage at about five to seven centimetres per pixel resolution, captures top-down imagery, multi-angle imagery, and actually builds 3D models of whole cities at 15 centimetre resolution. It is um, 
it is an absolutely wonderful data set to have at your back when you're trying to build machine learning products. The second thing, and this is the obligatory kind of AI picture slide. It's nice and generic. Um, um, and I think in many ways I see machine learning as a bit like a brain, not in kind of the, the, the tacky hyped up sense, but to be useful, a brain needs a body. Um, and in that same way, a machine learning model needs a body to be useful. It needs a body made of data pipelines and people and processes and bits of software and APIs. And that body is what I refer to as an AI system. Um, so again, NewMap's very much a tech company with you know, APIs that serve up thousands of requests a second and billions of images to users all around the world. Um, so I'm very lucky to be able to lean on a top-notch software engineering capability there whenever I need a little bit more help in the software department. Lastly, it's about deep technology development. And no, that's not the wrong picture. Um, when you're looking at complex systems, um, it takes time, design, collaboration, and acceptance of risk and the ability to fail and pick yourself up and try again. And I think the companies that understand this the best are actually the ones that build physical technology. So I started my career at Cochlear building these things where you take sound from the outside world, you put it through a microphone, it's then got to be turned into little electrical impulses that go into your brain and are recognised as speech. It's, it's kind of miraculous that it actually works. Um, I've also worked with underwater robots. Uh, for those unfamiliar with them, this is an autonomous underwater robot, which means you program it up, then you throw it off the back of a boat uh, with no cables or wires or anything. You can sort of communicate through a dodgy acoustic modem, and you really hope that it comes back in a few hours having mapped a large chunk of the seafloor. So the thing, about, the thing that links these ex two examples together is that no amount of design, no amount of bench testing, and no amount of planning will prepare you for the spectacular and unexpected ways these things will fail in the real world. Now, those of you who don't work with physical technology like this, those of you who work with data will probably know where I'm heading. I think data basically brings this real world messiness into software systems that are otherwise you know, nicely ordered and simple, and you start building in a model that can behave unpredictably or stochastically. I, I think it's warranted to have a little bit of discussion about the difference between machine learning and AI, um, because I, I actually do like to use the term and, and not purely for marketing purposes. Um, this is my favorite ever depiction of what machine learning is. Um, it's, it's worked on a number of non-technical people. I won't go into the description of it for you guys because I'm sure you know, but you're basically trying to pick between apples and oranges, and machine learning is the process of drawing that wiggly green line. There's a whole lot of stuff you can talk about there with, you know, apples and suddenly you introduce a Granny Smith apple that wasn't in the data set and where does it go? Beautiful illustration. But that's machine learning. Machine learning is about drawing that wiggly green line. Um, it's an algorithmic process. It's really an academic um, endeavor. What I consider as AI, my personal definition, is using software engineering to glue machine learning, statistics, people and processes together into a system that achieves a complex goal. So the tagline of this talk is, is AI systems more than models. Um, and if you just have a look at the very basic anatomy of what we do, um, we need to get a whole bunch of images and then we need to label them. And that already involves a whole lot of stuff. It involves APIs to deliver images. It involves sampling processes to choose which images to label. It involves sending off um, images to label, um, labeling tools, labeling kind of QA processes, a whole bunch of stuff there. Then once you've got that, you've got to turn that into a viable training set. And then you've got to build a model training system to take state-of-the-art models and train model after model after model until you get the best model you can get. Then once you've got your what, maybe three or 400 megabyte deep learning model weights file, you've got to do something with it. And that, that thing might be to run on 18 data centers in the cloud to run on a million square k's of imagery. Um, and that is no mean engineering feat in and of itself. Not only that, but really to, to take the full definition of AI, you want to be able to interact with and learn, and learn from your environment. So you need to be able to take the mistakes that you make, feed them back to improve your labels, then feed those labels into improved training sets, feed those training sets into improved models, tr improved models into improved outputs, and so on and so forth. 
This is the obligatory tech stack slide, which I'm hoping removes about 80% of the questions that you usually get, which is we're using TensorFlow and Keras and Docker and, and a bit of Go and Kubernetes and mostly Python. Um, Pachyderm is actually a really interesting thing. Um, the idea is it's, it's Git for data. So, you know, you, you have this kind of idea of version control for data. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in the tech stack, that's roughly it. We use other things as well. Um, and now I'm going to go into a series of, um, I guess, interesting pictures on what you can do with this data. So once we'd built that massive kind of petabyte scale data set, I sat down literally for a couple of e evenings and said, what, what interesting things can I pull out of it for the purposes of presentations? And I thought, well, let's find out what the top postcode in New South Wales is for solar uptake. And what pops up? Newington. 72% of houses have solar. That's the site of the Sydney Olympic Village. Just pops out of the data set where every single house had a solar panel. And obviously there's some other stuff in Newington. Second place goes to this sci-fi sounding place called Terra Nora in the far north coast of New South Wales with 48% of houses having solar panels. Now what about the US? Because we cover the US as well. So we, we've had 72%, 48%. What do you reckon the solar uptake is in the top zip code in Houston? I'll give you a clue. It starts with a one. It's 1%. <laughs> the top, sol top solar zip code in, in Houston is 1%. Why? It, there's plenty of sun. It's in Texas. There are zero incentives to put residential solar in. If you feed masses of energy back into the grid, you do not get a single cent. So when they do put it in, they put it all in the corner. Industrial. So you see this kind of beautiful realisation of, um, of public policy interacting with data science and, and all sorts of potential use cases. Let's have a bit of a look at construction. I'm not really a construction guy, but um, you, took, you take the top construction areas in Sydney and out jump Marsden Park, Leppington, Box Hill, Quakers Hill, um, those sort of areas um, just with the top construction going on. Um, and I'm going to finish this slide sequence with where we began, we're going to finish up on swimming pools. And I promise I found this purely by accident. I wasn't looking for it. I just thought, I wonder what the top zip code in, say, LA, which is one of the sites we look at, is for a number of swimming pools. 90210. <laughs> Beverly Hills 90210. It just pops out. In, you, you, you take a pandas data frame, sort by top of the list, 66% of properties have swimming pools. Um, all right. So. Just to be crystal clear on where we're at, um, in case there's, I guess this is going online, um, we have a, um, a petabyte scale data set. Um, it is commercial grade data. It is not yet commercially available, so there's no general availability yet, but we do have a beta program. So if you think you've got a use case, then please come and chat. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, we're basically mapping the evolution of whole cities over time at incredible nuance and incredible scale, um, which is uh, a, an incredibly fun thing to do. Uh, I'll now do what near mappers do best, which is to let the pictures speak for themselves with a fun video, hopefully. Oh, come on. Let's try again. That's worth it. Oh, I was almost there. There we go. This is all real data. And that is a real bar graph, not a fake one.
questions. Hopefully not about do you use PyTorch or TensorFlow and hopefully not which algorithm do you use. Go. <laughs> um, without risking to sound to terminate a judgment day, yep. and, um, you, you talked about how uh, an example where you know the models got so good and better than the human equivalents. Yep. What, well, what is still the, <laughs> the need of humans if, you know, if these models are now so yeah, good? Where are, uh, I guess, I guess in terms of a jobs perspective, your yeah. employment perspective, you know, how are things changing? How are data scientists needing to change? Or should we wait yeah. for Arnie and his other robots to um, AI us out of existence? Um, my last presentation had an Arnie pick in it. This one didn't. Um, so the, the, the question was around the, the model's getting so good that, you know, do we need humans anymore? Um, absolutely, we need humans still, um, even, even in the labelling case. If you're going to deploy real-world production models, you've got to accept that the second you put a model out there, no matter what industry you're in, the model is already stale and it's already old. You need to monitor the performance of that model over time. You need to continually train it. We're always expanding new geographies, tweaking our camera systems. The world changes, therefore your model has to change and adapt. Um, the, in terms of jobs and that kind of thing, there is no one today who sits there tagging every swimming pool manually in Australia to get an accurate log. Um, so this is not taking anyone's job who's doing that. Um, this is allowing people to do things that they haven't been able to do before. So previously someone might have said, oh, I need to know where a construction site is because I've got to go on, I don't know, there's someone who delivers coffee to construction sites. Before they might have a look at a few different construction sites, here you can give them a whole list. So it's really, um, it's, yeah, it's definitely not about replacement, it's about supercharging what people can do. Yes? Oh, your, one of your images of Perth, the one depicting green space, showed a very high density of green on the waterways in some of the narrower channels. Yeah. Almost clogging it. So is it actually capturing subsurface vegetation? No, no. Um, good pick. Um, no, that, that, that's a model flaw. Um, so I, I guess the focus that we've had is looking at um, data inside properties. So the, you know, what's going on in the water is we haven't really cared too much about. There are ways to get rid of that though. Um, I'm they were the swimming pools. Yeah, they, uh, in the early days they used to be a bit, but no, not with that amount of training data. Yes. So traditionally, data scientists could spend 8% of their time doing uh, data preparation. Yep. Um, more recently, I think people have recognized data science is like a team of people. Yep. And we have data engineers. Yep. Where, where in your organization are you finding it's most effective? Um, you know, how much are the data scientists still having to do data engineering versus how much do you, how, how do you think about splitting up work like that? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so it's about data engineering and, and how you split up work. Um, so in my team, we don't have hard boundaries between um, what I call machine learning engineering and data science. So for me, a machine learning engineer is someone who is at heart a software engineer who also knows about machine learning. So they're kind of building you know, robust, scalable software systems, but they know about machine learning. Data scientists can do fantastic things with models and they can code, and I include myself in this, I'm more on that side of the fence, um, you wouldn't trust to run large scale software systems. Um, but we, we have a blended team approach there, so we don't have the, the throwing over the fence issue that many teams have. Um, in terms of data engineering, we don't have quite the same need as many, um, um, many people with a big complex data warehouse because although this is a lot of data, in some ways it's fairly simple data. It's, it's visual data and it's trying to see, you know, is that an object or not? Um, so it's more about building software systems that can easily do their own data engineering, if that makes sense, um, and yeah, and creating reusable systems rather than carefully engineering individual features. There's obviously bits of, particularly in the post-processing, there's a lot of um, what's the best way to represent whether a swimming pool is actually in a property or not. Um, it, it's not obvious what to do straight up from semantic segmentation, but yeah. What are your biggest use cases so far? Um, so we just released um, the beta a couple of months ago. Um, uh, so a, a big interest point is, um, is in government. Um, so local governments particularly have to get a good understanding of what's going on in their area. Um, what new construction is going on so they can plan appropriate infrastructure, schools, that kind of thing. Um, uh, and you know they have to keep registers of things like swimming pools and solar panels uh, and that kind of thing. Um, but it, it's really the same as our 
our general user set. So we've got a very wide range of customers using our imagery for different things, from construction, engineering, insurance, government, um, what else? Um, anyway, th th there's, there's heaps. And really, um, the nice thing for my job is that we're just sitting on top of that stack of existing customers and they're saying, we're using your imagery, but we need to do it more automatically and more at scale and faster. So um, yeah, we've got, we've got a whole breadth of things, yep. Is there any privacy implications? Like, you know, if I go to swimming pool, I don't want to suddenly yeah. get a lot of people calling me to ask um, if they want to clean my swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think, um, I, I guess the answer is that there's, with data, there's always privacy implications of some kind. Um, we focus on mapping the physical world um, as opposed to the world of people. Um, and if you think about a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the data that people work with is, is much more sensitive than this, which is really what you can see walking down the street um, or you can see on you know, Google Maps or Street View. Um, it's just, you know, you, I, I, I started some home renovations a little while ago and within, I think, one day of the sign going up in front of my house, five neighbours as I walked the dog said, oh, you're doing renovations, what's going on? I'm like, oh, well, but I, yeah, there are certain things you don't get to decide. Um, it's a different scale, sure, but yeah. But you, there's always considerations, but um, yeah. Okay, one more question. Um, on the same topic of privacy, um, what about uh, like classified images? Like I saw you did Washington DC. There's obviously yep. a lot of buildings you can't take photos of in there, yep. especially aerially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, um, uh, when they fly over certain areas, that, so we, we design the camera systems and we, we run the flights. Um, they have to have a secret service agent sitting in the plane sometimes. And sometimes they'll say, we'll just turn off the camera for a bit. Um, so it's, it's not like satellite where you just can capture anything and the government can't do anything about it. Or they'll say, sorry, you can't fly there today. Um, so that's so that because air traffic control is in charge of where we fly, governments can choose if we're not meant to see stuff. We're building a secret swimming pool. Yeah. Yep. OK, could uh, all you humans, as well as any androids or cyborgs, if they're in the room, please join me in thanking Mike for a great presentation. Now, um, are there any announcements that anybody wants to make? This is the time, please. Hi, I'm Greg Pearl from the Onset Group. I head up the data science and analytic area there. Um, I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. Always fantastic uh, information uh, that we get from that. The Onset Group are the premium technical recruiters across obviously data science, machine learning, NLP, artificial intelligence. I'm here to help organisations build their analytics team and their analytics function uh, with, with superior talent. There's lots of people out there, really good individuals across a range of different sectors that, that could be beneficial. And obviously I'm also here for the data science community to assist um, with understanding the market, understanding what jobs are out there, how to get into data science. So please feel free to reach out. So again, it's Greg Pearl at the Onset Group and I look forward to seeing you at the next meetup. Hello. Hello. All right, I'll shout, okay. Uh, my name is uh, Cormac Purcell. I'm uh, an astronomer at Macquarie University. Um, I'm actually piloting to looking down quite a bit, and Macquarie is leading a, uh, a couple of workshops, or a workshop and a conference um, this is the cross-sensing workshop, um, which is going to take place in Coffs Harbour in 2019. Coffs Harbour, obviously, is a really nice place. Um, the idea here is bringing together industry and science. So we are um, heavily partnering with Fujitsu and NVIDIA, funded by the Office of the Chief Scientist and Engineer, um, and with support from CSIRO as well. The idea here is a dual conference. We've got two days of training workshops where we're taking um, science-focused people uh, through um, a basic introduction to machine learning, uh, but not just looking at um, uh, the standard looking at cats versus dogs that you might have on Kaggle, uh, but doing some science as well. Um, the idea here is we do some science, we figure out what's important to a scientist, and maybe calculating uncertainties 
uh, from a neural net, net network, but you don't also you don't also need to have uh, much experience with it. So we're trying to provide a code base that's open source that allows people to jump in at a uh, a good level to do their science. And the second part is trying to connect industry and multiple disciplines in science. So we're running a hackathon on the Thursday, and. Uh, with full support from uh, NVIDIA and Fujitsu, we're providing machine learning stations, drones, advanced cameras, um, hyperspectral imagers, uh, and then getting people to come up with project pitches and then uh, pitch their project, divide into teams, we'll support them for the hack, hack day, build what they want to build over the course of the day, and then um, save that for uh, as a resource uh, to the scientific uh, community. Okay, so that's in late November, last week in no November, um, all week. Uh, the other thing that we're running, which is closer to, to now, uh, we have a one-day workshop on running uh, on using drones and satellite imagery in uh, science. Uh, we've got some invited speakers from the U UK, uh, specifically um, uh, Professor Stephen Long Longmore, who is another uh, astrophysics person like myself, but uh, has pivoted over to doing drone ecology. Um, that's a free workshop, uh, runs on the 20th of September this year at Macquarie University in uh, North, North Ryde. Um, if anyone's interested in either of those, please come and talk, talk to me. Registration for the Drone and Satellite workshop is open right now, and it's free. Registration for the cross-sensing conference uh, will be open in a day or two, um, and it will be of order uh, two to $300 $3, dollars to register. We're hoping to bring it down, I'm expecting um, uh, a final confirmation of the registration figure uh, tomorrow. So check back to the website there. Thank you very much. Is this thing on, as they say? All right, here's my announcement. I am looking for, uh, hmm, I guess somewhere between an intern and a collaborator. Um, I have a number of algorithms that I have developed here that need to be out there. So I need people who can actually implement stuff and want to want to get new ideas out there in machine learning, out into the real world. In particular, I'm looking for someone who's fairly strong mathematically, knows their way around R, and isn't afraid of getting into the C code underlying particular R packages. The package I'm most interested in hacking into is the Ranger package, which is the, uh, the best random forest package in R. That's the, that's the uh, package of immediate interest. This is not a paid gig, but I think it will be fairly interesting and rewarding experience. And the idea is to get open source software and publications out. If you're interested, I think you know how to contact me. So uh, Dubasarski out. Anybody else got any announcements? Yep. What's your name? Uh, Rob Huey from Premonition. Um, thank you, Eugene. Always a, a tough, a tough act to follow. Um, so, yep, I am Robin Huey from Premonition, the data scientist over there. Uh, we write a software platform to make couriers better. Who has had a bad experience with a courier? <laughs> Oh wow, is that all? Okay, who's listening? <laughs> Same amount, okay, great. Um, so we write the software platform that will run these careers. Um, and then we have, uh, we have customers, we have data, um, and we have problems to solve with data. So if you're a data scientist that <coughs> can code, um, we should talk. Um, so it's premonition.io if you don't want to talk to me, but you still want to apply. Otherwise, I will be here afterwards and you can ask me whatever you like. Thanks, guys. Is that it for the announcements? In that case, please engage your own personal deep neural networks to actuate your uh, manual appendages and give uh, CBA a big hand for hosting this event.